Welcome back to another episode of a podcast from by a software engineer. I'm your host, Perry, and today we're talking to Alex Olmeyer. Alex, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me, Perry. Oh, no worries. Thanks for being on a show. Like, it's not often I get, like, absolutely interesting guests with a really even more fascinating background to begin with. So, yeah, I think the pleasure is mine for you to be on the show today. Um, actually, I really wanted to flex at the beginning to be like, Bonjour, Alex. Comment allez <laughs> Ça roule. Je te dis, je sais plus parler français. Moi, j'habite à Londres maintenant. Donc, uh, I, I have to do it in Franglish. And that's how the family rolls anyways. I just, we merge both languages. Yeah, I mean, like, very similar. My background, like, I grew up in a very, like, French-ish neighborhood uh, in Montreal. Well, you know, kind of a mixed bag. So we do speak multiple languages over here. So maybe you'll have the odd uh, viewer that really finds this entertaining. So <laughs> that's quite good. But hey, before all of this, though, um, yeah, for the people who don't know Alex yet, actually, what are you up to today? And, like, you know, what, what does your day-to-day look like? Yeah, I mean, I spend all of my time working on StepSize, the company that I co-founded with my brother and two of my greatest friends. I'll um, tell you all about it over the episode, of course, but quickly, we're all about helping other software companies deal with technical debt. So I, I suspect that'll be one of the big topics in the episode. That's obviously one of the bigger reasons I find you absolutely fascinating, because this is a space that not everybody likes talking about, especially yeah. the technical debt bit. Um, and coming from like a software engineer, like this is probably one of the griefest word I could like put out of my mouth. So um, I'm going to be way more happy to dive into it probably than you are at the end of this. So. Oh, no, that's that's my day today. I'm telling you that's I spend my day talking to software engineers and their, their teammates about technical debt. So I'm more than happy to do it. And I'm pretty sure we're going to be taking a lot of like good advices out of this. So. I mean, we already know a couple of things about you. Like, yeah, you were saying that you do speak French and um, you have heard of multicultural influence from your whole life. So I'd love to, you know, explore that a bit kind of thing, figure out your life influences and basically how we map the journey from way back all the way to today. So, I mean, if we start, you know, quite generally, like where did you grow up kind of thing? Yeah, I was um, born and raised in Paris or just outside of Paris. You know, my uh, I was a uh, sort of first child that my parents had. So I thought they should go for a fancy hospital in a fancy neighborhood in Paris. Then they moved to the suburbs, west of Paris mostly. And um, I went to an international school, hence the uh, weird mishmash of accents. You, it, people usually can't quite tell where I come from, but no, I'm indeed a, a Frenchie. I sort of grew up spending all of my time doing sports mostly. My family was into breeding horses. So believe it or not, I used to be a professional show jumper before I did anything relating to business and technology. And up until my early 20s, you know, I, I sort of I kept going to school. I, I did my um, undergrad degree in Paris, mostly in business management and English and history and economics and all that type of jazz. But most of my time, Pretty much all of my time was spent riding horses. And in the uh, meantime, my brother fucked off to the other side of the, the pond. Well, not the pond, the, uh, the channel. He was in London with our two friends, Matt and Jared, who later became our co-founders. And he was studying mathematics with them and later data science. And I say this because at some point I pretty badly injured my back. And so... I sort of had to question whether or not I was going to spend the rest of my days shoveling horseshit and, and jumping over fences. And um, either way, I had bigger, broader ambitions. So I did everything I could to try to go to the other side of the channel and, and join him. And I ended up at um, the University University of Sussex in Brighton, so south of London by the coast, having a great time, but also studying entrepreneurship and management. And it's kind of a, a weird thing. You wouldn't think that entrepreneurship is a thing you can study. You just kind of have to do it. I agree. So we started building all kinds of stuff. And following that, we spent, you know, we all, we all got jobs in, in different startups. We were living together in London after we were done with our degrees. And we spend all our evenings and weekends building things, mobile apps, websites. We just, we wanted to build something together. And it's that experience that led us to think long and hard about how people develop software. And maybe you'll ask me about it later, but that, that sort of brings us to the early days of, of StepSize where, I'm not sure if you want me to go into the story right now, but essentially we, we quit our jobs, took the deep dive, went and, and lived on top of the Chinese restaurant that Jared, my co-founder's parents, used to run by the coast in Hastings again. So I went, went back to the coast, southern coast of England, and we spent six months 
working on our stuff before Techstars took pity on us and, and invested and, and we went back to London, raised, you know, fast forward maybe sort of four years, raised a couple round of, uh, rounds of funding, a few million pounds to, um, to, to build StepSize and here we are today. I was going to say like, there's so many understatements, sorry, that I've gotten from all of this. Like when you were saying like even just co-founding a project to begin with, like that's a massive step for a lot of people to even think about. And then like from this journey that you've cruised on and like obviously there were hardships, but there are also pretty a lot of moments, I guess you would like enjoy the whole thing. I feel like you just described a movie. Are you sure you haven't already had a movie based off of you? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, nope, but it certainly feels like several lines. I, I, I'm really lucky. But um, yeah, that's. I thought I'd give you the uh, the highlights, you know, and then we can dive into whatever seems interesting. Oh, well, I mean, it's going to be hard because everything is interesting. But <laughs> but I'm really glad that you also brought up the educational background. So when we talk about life influences, sorry, there's always like the growing up bit where family, friends and all that. But another very important bit that actually kind of justifies your drive today, you know, your, you know, your, your want to do attitude um, is obviously the educational background. And you've mentioned already that you've um, went to international school, which is always, always interesting to talk about. How did that come about I guess like did you know that you were going to international school to begin with or like how, how does that work I'm just saying this because I'm obviously I've never went to international school and I've been part of just the very straightforward Montreal system you know I mean if, you, if, you, if you're asking where the drive come, comes from that's that's always it, it's hard to tell for sure I can only speculate and sort of think back I I never enjoyed school too much um, you know growing up when I was a kid it was it was I was lucky it was easy and then I went to, 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 to this international school in question where, where it started off great. Then I had this thing where I injured my back, I ended up sick. I, I missed, you know, sort of six months of my two last years of, of high school. And so everything became super difficult all of a sudden. And, um, you know, going to school, getting a degree was just kind of a thing that you, you did and, and rightfully so. And I, I'm glad that my parents um, sort of encouraged me to do that but at the same time it wasn't um, it wasn't where I had the most fun if you will so for me it was seeing my my parents seeing my uncle seeing my grandfather doing the whole entrepreneurship thing that was just that was just a thing in the family you know people would figure their shit out and and build their own thing and I I, I always admired that and um, it was um it was the biggest adventure that you could go on. So I, that's where when I when I when I messed up my back and I couldn't rely on on sort of a career as an athlete anymore. Or at least I thought it wasn't reasonable. I had to think about what I wanted to do. And the prospect of I don't know becoming an academic was not an option. The idea of working for some big company out there wasn't an option. I just had to go and figure my own thing out and. You know, that, that was something that we both aspired to with my brother. So I just thought, well, fuck it, let's get to, let's get to the same location and, and get it going. Yeah, that definitely explains, like, that defines the drive I was literally just talking about. And also, I just want to echo real quickly that, like, I personally, I have to admit that I wasn't a big fan of school either. I feel, I feel like I've said this enough times in, like, either, like, previous moments, whatever, but like, not everybody enjoyed school at the end. Yeah, you get a lot of it, a lot out of it, but there, you know, there's always also a lot of reason that goes on the other side. But hey, super brave on you for saying it. I'll say it as well. Like school wasn't the exact thing. And we could also see that when you were just mentioning like the uh, the major influence of having this dedication and just stepping into the, you know, uncomfortable zone might wasn't directly from the educational background. And it's probably from like, you know, the influence from your daily life, even some of your professional background that we're going to dive into after and see how that actually, you know, kept on pushing you to get to, I guess, where you are today. And um, yeah, one of the concepts that I'm actually quite cool that, you know, as we talk about this is uh, the diversification, the the fact that you haven't put all your eggs in a single basket, just because you had the sports going on, and then you had the studies going on, like you knew that as you know, as a, as a realistic person, um, you're gonna have to be able to find a way out, which I mean, you did at the end. So that is really, really cool to think about. Um, so funny enough, we were talking about all this international school that was during your high school phase. Um, after that, actually, did you go to university? Did you do, or did you jump straight into like working? What did that look like? Yeah. Yeah. You start, you may be 15 to 16, then 16 to 17 and 17 to 18, you get the, your, your baccalaureate. So the first one of these years went great. You know, you sort of show up at this international school. It's, um, 
highly competitive. There's a lot of pressure. You're, you're still cruising. School's going great. And then uh, you, um, I say you, I, I'll just say I, I, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I injured my back um, doing judo. I ended up with a spinal hernia, which doesn't sound that bad, but for me it was terrible because I couldn't do any sports. So I, I you sort of, over time, had a real hard time walking properly. You sort of all crumpled up like a little old, old man. I had to take painkillers and, you know, sort of ended up on morphine that you, you pop your pill every four hours because that's how you are, you're able to function because it's too much pain otherwise. And I spent a year and a half like this. It sounds stupid, but ended up catching whooping cough because my immune system was totally destroyed from all these painkillers and, and um, different medications that I had to take to to get through this. And so I missed, you know, months and months and months of school. And fast forward to the baccalaureate, I've just, you know, I've, <laughs> I'm, I'm not ready, but I do it anyways. So I end up with pretty average grades and uh, I didn't know what to do with my life. You know, I, d I didn't know if I could go and, and make riding horses my thing, my profession. I didn't know if I could go off and get a job at the moment. I didn't know if I could go and get some kind of degree because in France, there's this weird thing as well where you might be interested in computer science. You might want to be, you know, you might be interested in coding, but unless if you have great grades in mathematics, they'll tell you you can't go do that for some reason. And since then, I've written a lot of code and, and trust me, it doesn't work because I'm, I'm good at maths. So anyway, I went from, um, you know, in France, it's, it's great. University is free. Well, not, not all of them, but th there is such a thing as a state university. And I went for one of these um, you know, fairly general dual degrees that was on the one hand business and economics. And on the other hand, they called it English literature and civilization or something like that. So there was some, some literature, some, some history, all of this jazz. So it was a, a bilingual degree. And really, it was just um, it's just a thing to do a few hours a, a week, you know, maybe eight to ten hours of, of classes while I figured my shit out and I got back into riding and I was riding at a professional level and it was great but really I didn't know what I wanted to do with my life and it wasn't until after I was done with these uh, about four years that I decided that I was going to go get another degree a master's degree in the UK um, really to get closer to my brother and eventually start our thing so you know I what I learned in that degree, I don't think influenced much of what happened in my life afterwards. Yeah, that's fair to say, actually. Um, and it was actually really cool that when you're talking about you ended up getting a double back to begin with. Um, and this combination of economics and management and English literature as well kind of gives like a balanced approach to it, right? Um, as, we're, as we're talking like just way before already where, you know, different eggs and different basket is that what you do nowadays do require you to have all this kind of coverage, all this kind of knowledge in terms of not only the technical aspect to it, but also like just the creative bit to it, which, I mean, I keep on saying that like a lot of the tech people, like I'm speaking for myself is that like somehow we just miss some of the creative side to it, which is really weird to say. I'm going to get so much flack for saying that. But, <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, when, you, when you're saying like when you end up doing this double back in entrepreneurship and English literature, sorry, you could already see there's some sort of balance and like some sort of like foundation that you're able to move forward to with. So that was actually pretty cool. And then when you mentioned that you ended up doing a master's as well, uh, was that in management as well? Or was that in a different topic? Yeah, so to, to clarify, I got my, you know, there's this, there's the, this thing called the, uh, some version of the international baccalaureate. That's what I did at the end of high school. That That's where I got my average results. Then I went to do the double bachelor's degree, which was the one in, you can think of it as business and English essentially. And then I went to do this master's in management and entrepreneurship in the UK at the University of Sussex. And the one thing I'll say is, um, you know, I, it, was, it was amazing that my mum took the time to speak to us in, in English. You know, English is, is um, uh, I suppose, a first language for her, if you will. Despite the fact that we were living in France, I already spoke English and that just opened a, a ton of options. That was that was the main thing. And so this degree that I got at the University of Sussex, I, I thought was a lot more interesting. The way they teach in the 
UK is very different than the way they taught at French universities. It was a lot more, um, it was a lot more engaging for me. There was a lot more, um, you actually got to apply your stuff. You know, we, for example, we had um, this idea for um, a little mobile application with, um, again, we were already building things with the guys at the time, it was this um, application to hook up students with potential tutors, very simple thing. And uh, I remember going in to pitch some people at the innovation center at the University of Sussex, and then they gave you a little little grant of like, 10,000 pounds to go off and, and use to build out your business. What they didn't tell you is that they had to approve everything that you wanted to spend it on and that they wanted you to spend it on services at the innovation center. So it wasn't very helpful, but never mind. Yeah. So I, I enjoyed the master's degree a lot more than I did um, my, my undergrad degree and it showed. I did a lot better for my master's degree than my undergrad degree. That's great, because that was the time where you actually had like more of a focus, more of a spe specialization, sorry, because um, I think just even in general concept, before you actually get to that point, like when you study uh, your end of high school, uh, university stuff, it's still quite general. But when we, we reach a master's level, and when we're even talking about like uh, post-university or when you're actually diving to one of the entrepreneurial project that you did during at that time, uh, that's always fascinating to be like, first of all, 10 thousand dollars sorry ten thousand pounds for like a grad student like it's always like a mesmerizing sum no matter how you look at it i know <laughs> that's, that's I always know. something it was great that, uh, i think it's really cool that you actually got the chance to do it so um you mentioned that it was a project where you hook up people with like tutors and everything can you give us a bit more on that i find that absolutely fascinating because a lot of like the services nowadays is about like you know plugging people to uh, with each other like I'll, uber for example it's like plugging drivers with the user the end user at the end so what was uh, what was the I guess the, the project, what was it called when you did it during that, uh, that time? Yeah. 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 I'll tell you all about it. If I may just go back to a thing that you mentioned, cause I think it's important to flag for people. I mean, maybe you have listeners who are trying to figure this stuff out. I always found it crazy to expect, you know, a 16 or 18 year old or 20 year old or like 25 year old to be absolutely set and know exactly what they want to do with their lives. I mean, I know it's a thing that stressed me out so much, even when I was in high school and people would ask you like, so what are you going to be? What are you going to study? I have no fucking clue, you know? So I, I'm the, the thing that was really good with, um, my, my mom was great with that actually is she, she knew that this was the case and she didn't expect us to figure it out. She just said, look, no one knows what they want to do. Just go off and pick a, a degree and do a thing because it's by doing things that you're going to figure out what you like and what you should do afterwards. And I did that for the undergrad. And then with the master's degree, I, I happened to have a goal. I was like, look, at, at the end of this thing, we're going to end up building a business with, with my brother and my friends. So there was a lot more direction, but I think it's fine if you don't have it and also once you find that direction it might change and that's okay you know so sorry for the change of topic i just that's that's a thing that's important to me so i wanted to go into it a little bit now i can answer your question about tutor map oh no i was gonna say like that was what you just said absolutely needed to be say um the yeah. amount of times that i've seen people in that position me included of coming out here into the, i guess the real ish world and not having a clue about what you're gonna do or what everybody's yeah. ex expecting you to do it's so common. Like, don't ever feel that if you're in that spot that you're the only person there. As we just heard from Alex, as you just heard from me as well, like, life will find a path for you, whatever it is. Yeah. And the thing is, like, you should be the one that has the confidence and the attitude to take control of it, right? Especially how you were saying you've already gone through so much, even before life technically started after study. Uh, and you've managed to always find a path. And, and when you're saying the influence, like your mom giving you that drive and telling you, look, the world is big out there. And if you don't know your path right now, it will find you. There's going to be a path that somehow builds from everything. So I'm so I glad agree. I just put it in words probably much better than, than I do most of the time. So, um, but the thing is, yeah, if we, if we bounce back straight onto the, the tutor map you were mentioning, yeah, that was one yeah. of the, uh, I guess, defining moments when you actually had like a bit of uh, direct influence into what you're creating as somebody with uh, a bit of resource, but also like an idea. So uh, what was the idea and like, how did that process went along throughout the whole journey of your master's? Yeah. 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 So oh, that's, that's a funny story. We actually at the time, and we're still all super close friends. We, before there was tutor map, there was 
our first idea for a thing that we could build. And I remember we were hanging out with a bunch of friends, there's maybe seven of us, um, some of my closest friends to this day. And I, I tell this story because I'll tell you how their lives were influenced by this tiny seed of an, of an idea that we had. Okay. Um, so before this tutor map, there's this thing called Clip It. And I remember us, I'll skip some of the details because it's a long story. I remember all of us hanging out together and um, our friend John sort of lying catatonic on a bed after a big night out. And um, we were playing some music in this little uh, room where we were all hanging out. And a friend of ours took a picture of our friend John on his bed and looked at the picture after the fact and realized, damn, this thing's not nearly as interesting as the moment was when I was taking that picture. You know, the music's playing in the background. John's, you know, exhausted after a long night out. It's not captured in that picture. And so we thought, wouldn't it be cool if you could somehow link that picture to the song that was playing in the background? And that was the first seed of an idea that we had. And at the time, bear in mind, none of us have studied computer science, built a, built a thing or anything like this. And we go, well, screw it, let's build it. And our friend, uh, John, in this case, um, jumped on it. He, he, he had also been studying business and he figured, I'm, I'm going to build the prototype. And he built the prototype and it was the most exciting thing that we'd ever seen. You know, it's like we had an idea and we, and we built a thing. And I'm, you know, I'm mentioning this story and I said it, it, it influenced everyone's lives a bunch. You know, in that group, we have John who converted himself from you know, general business person to software engineer, ended up when uh, becoming one of the first um, hires at a company called PillPack that was acquired by Amazon for a billion dollars or something like that. So his life took a turn then. My cousin Elliot was part of that group as well. He is now, as he was also studying with John at, at Babson, you know, sort of general business studies. He's now a, a data scientist, you know, several years later. So he, he changed his path as well. Our friend uh, Yannick, who was there, he ended up creating his own music label, his own record label in Amsterdam, doing great off the back of, you know, so you build all sorts of confidence building your first little thing like this. And then the rest of the group is the co-founders that became StepSize, right? And then after this little idea called Clip It, we, we got serious about building software. So that's when I said, you know, I, I, I would spend most of my time at work, um, different companies doing business development and sales and all that kind of stuff. But all our evenings and weekends were spent writing code, shitty code at the time, you know, but writing code. And one of the things that we built was TutorMap, which was, you know, we started thinking about how we could make a little bit of extra cash to, um, to save up and eventually not need to stay on our jobs to, to start our companies. And we were still students at the time. So we figured, well, maybe we should do some tutoring. And uh, Nick, Matt and Jared, my co-founders, were all three pretty good at mathematics they were studying at UCL at the time. And so we figured, well, let's, let's sort of, you know, advertise your services and um, get you uh, tutoring some students. And for some reason, I don't remember the logic because it doesn't make sense. I think we just wanted to build a mobile app as opposed to a website. So we built it as a mobile app and it was a little marketplace to hook up students with, with uh, maths tutors. And we went off to UCL and I remember we, we put up little posters advertising the, uh, the application um, in, in places that were really hard to reach. So like Jared would climb on my shoulders and we'd put it on the ceiling in the staircase so that people would check it out. And we eventually yeah. got a bit of traction. Yeah, we know we did stupid things like that. And we got a bit of traction. You know, we had, I don't know, maybe like sort of 50 tutors and, and, and 150 students. And we're like, wow, this, this thing's cool. It's, it's going somewhere. And we ended up ditching it because despite the traction, we realized that it, it wasn't the thing that we wanted to be working on for the next decade. You know, we, we wanted something else to dedicate most of our professional lives to. And so we kept looking for our next thing. But that's the story of, of Tutor Map and, and I suppose where our first, um, you know, little, little spurt of entrepreneurship and, and building things came from i absolutely love the word because entrepreneurship that's definitely like what we're talking about here it's about mm -hmm. you know when you think these are life-changing moments a lot of people yeah. get exposed to these kind of instances in their life but what stood out in a lot of those cases that we're just talking about is that you have people who just see them happen 
and then be like, all right, then they go back onto their path. But there's other people who just sees these moments happen and they, then they grasp it and then they do even more on top of that. And that's kind of how it just projects them to a different direction. And as we we're saying, like the example of becoming one of the early members of Pill Pack, which is obviously a really hot topic in the past coming uh, past couple of months, actually. So that is the examples of people that will grasp these changes, these like opportunities, and they'll keep on pushing that. So it is so good to have a direct example out of you and your mates at the end of the day, basically. Yeah, yeah. It's kind of mind blowing. Every time we think about it, it it, it makes us smile. But I, I remember the energy that we got from from all of us being excited about these ideas. And, and you know, in the moment, you don't realize how much is going to influence your life. But uh, fast forward, what, seven years, maybe closer to 10 years, actually, from, from that point in time, you realize how much just hanging out with these people and, and having fun with a group of creative and, and resourceful peeps will will change things for us. I mean, you know, we spoke about how my undergrad degree didn't have much influence for, for me, how my master's had a bit more influence for me. And then I would say hanging out with these people just set me on that path that, that I'm on today and, and will be on for yeah, forever, I think. I, I don't see myself doing anything else, you know? <laughs> it definitely doesn't go away. To, like, I could definitely see it and hear it as well. Um, one yeah. of the really cool thing that uh, you're just mentioning is that like you have these moments of, you know, it, it seems menial, right? It seems like it's just something that uh, just a couple of people looking at a photo. Like, you know, it really sounds menial. But the thing is like, if it's a relatable menial idea, a relatable menial feature, or whatever you want to call it, like it's not menial at the end of the day. It's something that has impact. It doesn't have to be like super stardom. Like it's not because... 1% of the world lives like Hollywood that like that is the standard everybody you know wants to achieve is that we have yeah. a lot of stuff going on in our daily lives that is super relatable to everybody and if you experience it somebody else experience it and if you find it interesting yeah. chances are somebody else is going to be in the same boat and find it interesting so this is definitely like the kind of seed and the kind of I mean even just having the definition of having a drive like these are kind of what drives people you don't you don't get driven by seeing yeah. the luxury at the one percent at the end of the day no you get driven by your daily life and what you enjoy doing and then when you're saying like if hanging out with people that have really interesting thoughts then that was probably the only reason you need to do it so that was actually really yeah, cool yeah, yeah. and um one other thing as well is the uh when you're talking about doing this mostly on the weekends or like even off times that kind of means that we were talking about like you would consider that like a side project kind of thing to begin with so I guess during that time of your life, you had a main project and the side project. What was that that main project? I think you mentioned you were doing uh, business development. Yeah, so uh, I'll try to get back to the timeline. So I, I graduate from my master's. I move back to London. We move in with my um, now co-founders and we find jobs to you know live. And um, we all found jobs at different startups. I, I started working uh, you know, as a sales associate, like entry-level job at a company called Iovox that still does call tracking and analytics. So think about it as Google Analytics for the phone. And we would try to sell the software to, um, well, businesses that have phone numbers on their websites, like say big property portals and all that type of jazz. So I, I spent my days doing that and learning as much as I could from a startup that had sort of raised a series A and was trying to make it like everyone else out there. And uh, yeah, every evening we, we, we got home and we sat down together and we got to work. And then we did that on the weekends and rinse and repeat. That was, that was our life. We didn't do anything else. It's not terribly exciting. If someone were to make a movie about it, there'd just be a bunch of guys in front of computers. It's not, it's not very sexy. And then um, after that, I ended up joining an another company called Judil that had raised a series B. And, you know, I, I went from being a sales associate to, to doing business development, being a bit more autonomous, you get promoted along the way, etc. And uh, I ended up doing the same thing at this company called Judil that would sort of use um, information about private companies that you could find on the web to help companies make all kinds of risk assessment, you know, whether it be uh, to, to lend money to them to decide whether they'd make for a good customer or that or that type of jazz. And six months in is when six months into that job, I mean, is when we stumbled across the idea for step size and I ended up leaving and I felt really bad about it because it's, it's a great company and I don't like to, you know, I'd made a commitment to work at this place and, 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 and I decided to leave. I mean, it was the, the right move in the end, but um, yeah, that's the timeline. Yeah, that's actually, I mean, those are really uh, 
I keep on using the word relatable because it does happen yeah. to a lot of people when this kind of this kind of decision happens, right? When uh, you you have a lot of stuff going on in your life. And first of all, when you're saying like it was really boring that you ended up, you know, from your day job and then going straight into your side project. Like I, I'm going to speak for the people that finds this stuff absolutely fascinating. Yeah. As in, <laughs> um, you make it sound like, yeah, it's just a couple of people just staring at a computer at the end of the day. Like it's, it's definitely way more than that. I'm pretty sure you know it because you've experienced it. It's like from the outside, it looks like this, but we were so pumped. We were so excited. We bought, I mean, our living room, you should have seen it had, a whiteboard there was a massive whiteboard that we bought and we actually we kept it up until uh, we moved offices this year we had to get rid of it and there was like sticky notes all over the walls and there desks with computers everywhere and the couch in the middle of it and our little coffee table and tv and that was it it was our lives were designed to build this thing <laughs> and when i was saying like when i when i find this interesting it's just because i'm an absolute geek about this stuff so <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's yeah. kind of mostly the reason why but um the, the cool thing is that like i'm just comparing this because a lot of time it's so easy to just go back home and just be like i'll just take the rest of the day off which you should i mean obviously that's yeah when you when you do your job and then you come back but then like when you actually see an example of people actually spending this extra time this this extra commitment on something that they're really passionate about you do have projects that come out of it and you have this other viable way of living your life at the end of the day which you ended up doing with step size so that is absolutely fantastic to know um actually when you were mentioning that you're doing business development um i've met you know quite a couple of people that i've worked with that does business development what mm-hmm. exactly does that entail just as a general concept for you know the, the lesser familiar like me because i'm pretty sure day to day you you do have to do as a co-founder and ceo sorry today that you do have to do some business development as well. So um, yeah, what exactly is the concept of uh, business mm-hmm. development? Yeah, so different different companies use the title a bit differently. When I was doing business development at these businesses, it was mostly sales. But typically it's, um, you know, bigger, slightly more complicated sale uh, with, you know, in, in this case, it was a B2B sale that involved a lot of different people to make this big decision about integrating the product into their their product, if you will. Our product into their product is driven by an API and whatnot. It's not just a sort of buy, consume and forget thing. And then there are companies that use the term business development as people who are there to try and build out partnerships with other companies that are mutually beneficial um, so if I think about business development for step size, it might be things like, okay, we built an integration with Jira. Let's go have a chat with Atlassian about them helping us put this in front of their customers. And what they get out of it is hopefully our integration makes their product, their money maker Jira a bit more sticky. And there's their incentive to um, you know help us market this thing. So you can think of it in terms of partnerships and sales. Yeah, I think that was a very clear the way you, you put that is it's really easy to um, understand that it's a proactive concept as opposed to a reactive concept, mm-hmm. if I'm not mistaken. As in yeah. um, when we're talking about like business development, this is the point where uh, your roles and the individuals involved in this task is really to outreach and really just to make sure that you're seizing the opportunity that uh, that are out there, that are potentially out there and that needs to be found to begin with. So. Um, I really do like the your way of putting business development as something that is proactive as opposed to uh, some other roles where their tasks are more, you know, they receive a task and then they have to respond to it and then they go back to it. So that is, uh, I think that definitely did help you in the long run uh, from what for you're sure. doing today. Like, I feel like uh, that must have been a crazy big influence for, you know, the project they're working on nowadays. So one thing I do want to dive even more, actually, because uh, we already been breathing here and hearing this. Uh, it's the entrepreneurship, the actual task of starting with nothing and going to a point where, you know, you're you're getting some revenue out of it, you're getting some features out of it, you're getting some product out of it, users are being affected by this. Yeah. So I think the one point that I hear a lot of people talking and wondering is how do you make the jump? So you know how you had like the main project of, I would call like a nine to five, right? How you would just do your job and like do that kind yeah, of stuff. Yeah. And then this this jump to the unknown, this jump to the what am I going to do with this project kind of thing? So I think my question would be like, what made you do the jump or what makes one person do the jump? Yeah, yeah, that is a great question. And I I think that the reality of it, the short answer is, is extremely personal and every person will have their own version of it. And it depends so much on the 
circumstances in which you find yourself in your life at the time. So I suppose I'll tell you about mine and I'll explain how we came to make the jump. Um, so, you know, to set the scene, we're working for these startups during the day. We spend all our evenings and weekends working on our side projects that we hope will, will become a business at the time. And we're, we're growing frustrated. Shit is so slow. Like it takes ages to do anything. And we realize that if we want to be serious about this, you've, you've, just, you've got to dedicate as much time as you can to it. And that led us to um, reconsider, for example, what we were doing with TutorMap. Like I said, right, we realized, well, that, that's not exactly the thing we want to be doing for the next 10 years. So let's think about something else. And I still remember um, that evening when we got the idea for step size. My uh, brother, Nick, had started messing about. I don't, I don't know if you remember, but um, I think that's sort of 20, 2015. There were people who were using neural networks to try and generate, like train them on, say, Shakespeare, Shakespeare's work and try to generate original Shakespeare. And it looked a lot like Shakespeare. And Nick had the thought of, well, maybe we can just run this thing on code and see what happens. And so he um, yeah. We got, yeah, we, we got all the code that we could get. It was Python Flask code, I remember specifically. Everything that we could get from Stack Overflow and um, open source projects on GitHub. And we trained that neural net on the thing. And we had it take an input, uh, you know, the beginning of a, a, an endpoint uh, in uh, using the Flask framework and, and asked it to generate the rest. And it looked a lot like Python Flask code. And of course, it wasn't functional code, but we thought, holy shit, it looks a lot like code. And that got us thinking really deep about what is it that you could do if you were to apply a lot of these new technologies in the world of machine learning and AI to the way people develop software. And we went deep. I'll spare you some of the steps, but where we ended up was... Well, theoretically, in a few decades, using these technologies, you should be able to build a system that would take, air quotes, normal human input, you know, spoken word, written word, uh, doodles, designs, all that kind of stuff, and generate the code necessary to build the thing. Again, I'm skipping a ton of steps and, and simplifying it, but that just kind of blew our minds. And we thought, well, you, you're kind of there if you think about programming as a language, we often use the term, but if you actually think about it as a language, it's not too dissimilar from the technologies that um, people were shipping at the time that helped you translate English to French, for example. But the data sets that you were working with, if you were, if you were to try to apply this to programming, were a lot harder to get your hands on. And so we sort of devised this plan for a potential business that would be about building products that engineers can use to do their day-to-day -day jobs that would leverage the data that they use in their, and, and create in their day-to-day -day jobs to help them be better at shipping software and eventually build a data set of what we called contextualized code. So think about it as you know, a version-controlled code base with every point in its history plus all the metadata that could describe it. So like the Jira ticket that's plain English describing the intent behind the code, the stuff that comes out of your APM tool that's like numerical data relating to the performance of that code, yada, 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 all that stuff. And if you were able to build that data set by building something so valuable that people you know, integrate with their tools, give you access to that data and use the tool day to day to differentiate that data set, then you'd be able to iterate your way to that crazy vision of a system that allows anyone who can read, write or doodle to build software. And so you can tell by the way I'm talking about it, we were just so excited by the stuff. And we had spent the whole evening talking about it over a glass of wine or some cheap booze at the time because we didn't have any money. And it's like two in the morning and we'd been geeking out about this and, and Jared's mother had told him, well, you know what? At the moment, the, the chef that used to work at the Chinese restaurant and live on top of the Chinese restaurant, he, he and his family just left. So like the, the little apartment on top of the restaurant is free and you guys can stay there if you want. Um, you know, the, the implied deal was that Jared was going to have to help her in the restaurant, <laughs> but we could stay there for free. And so there was like this little window of we're so pumped about this idea that we've decided we'd be we'd be down to work on this for the, the rest of our lives because it is a multi-decade plan. Plus, 
we're lucky enough that Jared's parents would host us and take care of us until we get this thing off the ground. And so we sat on the couch at two in the morning and we're debating whether we should take the jump. And I still remember my brother, Nick, who sort of takes takes a sip of his cheap booze and like looks at me and he goes, well, what else are we going to do? And I was like, that's it. I'm in. That's we're, we're ready to go. You know, what the fuck else are we going to do? Uh, none of us were the kinds of people that did particularly well having having a job, having a boss, you know, that sort of people get really intense about doing things well and get really upset about things that are inefficient. I'm incapable of following instructions if I don't know why I'm doing this, this, this thing in the first place. One of the reasons why I didn't like school. And so we had this, you know, little team of four with, uh, with an, uh, uh, okay, you know, it was, it was falling apart a little bit, but a little apartment waiting for us by the coast in Hastings. And, um, you know, about 10,000 pound, pounds in the bank, I think yeah, about 8,000 pounds in the bank each to survive for a year, you know, because we didn't have to pay rent. So we did our little budgets and then we decided that we were going to quit our jobs and move on top of the Chinese restaurant. So that's that's how we made the decision. And you can tell that, you know, the circumstances in which you find yourself in, in your life at the time have such a great influence. We were so lucky that Jared's parents were were uh, willing and able to um, to have a stay at their place, you know. You know what else I was like? I was talking about the movie. This is the movie. What, yeah. like, what, what were we talking about? Because, I mean, all these moments when you're sitting around and you remember very vividly the context. Cheap booze, we've all been part of it. We've all had that kind of life. It was either moments like that where, you know, you look at the people around, you look at the picture or some somebody else might just be looking into a fire, I guess. They'll be looking at a bonfire and be like, <laughs> this is the time. This is kind of like the, the moments. And then when you were talking about the jump and you guys made it, like, you need to have admiration for that. No matter what you do it for the people who have done it and for the people who haven't done it, I think you definitely need to have admiration for it. Just because that That's is nice. <laughs> what you know that what makes what makes you do what you do today, right? When you're saying defying the rules, defying the the all the boundaries and all that. If you weren't that kind of person, you wouldn't be doing it. So, um, yeah, I mean that 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 story just got me even more driven. Like I'm just sitting here That's to, right. to begin with, but it's just a story that really like any better good movie out there that gives you that extra oomph to to make the jump, which yeah, is yeah. basically what we're talking about this whole time. So it's exciting. But, you know, on, on top of, um, you know, of course you need to be that kind of person. But just to be clear, the fact that I had Nick, Jared, and Matt, who were just as, they're the same, it just gives you so much more courage. So, you know, we're, we're very lucky to have each other as well. I probably, you know, I, I wouldn't be there if it weren't for them, clearly, and I, I'm, I'm sure they'll reciprocate. So if you have that, that team of peeps like that, it just um, gets you so pumped up. <laughs> yeah i was gonna say actually that's a, a pretty good transition actually in terms of like one of the things that i do hear people talk about is uh how do you choose your co-founders and funny enough i guess there are cases where the co-founders chooses you right so i think one mm -hmm. of the bigger topic is basically like this is very general i guess is when you start a new project there's i guess two paths either you solo found it or you co-found it with a couple of people yeah. um i mean you have been part of this experience, actually, but I guess I, we just want to hear like your your take on solo founding versus co-founding. Like, what are yeah, the differences, yeah. and uh, how does how does that feel when it happens? Yeah, oh, um, that's that's a, a tough question. I and and again, I think it's it's a personal thing. I'm so glad I'm not doing this by myself. I mean, it gets so fucking hard that why would you make it even harder on yourself? I mean, there are moments where you know, you're in the gutter and I've got three other guys who are going to pick up your slack and, and move the whole thing forward, you know, push the boulder uphill. So I would, I would advise people if they can to go find co-founders that are, you know, it's, it's really good that we were lucky that all four of us had very complementary skills, you know, on top of being a data scientist, Nick's a product guy, on top of be, being a, a, a mathematician, Jared's a front-end engineer and designer, Matt makes for a great CTO, he's just, you know, on top of being a data scientist, just an all-round top technologist, and I do the business development piece and all the people stuff. It just worked out perfectly. I've never done the whole co-founder dating thing. So I can't advise on this. You know, one of my co-founders is my brother. The other one, Matt. So Matt had the same um, journey as, as we did. He went to the same international school that I mentioned. 
then he studied with Nick at UCL when I was still in, in Paris. Like we were from the same little town outside of Paris. And then Jared is like the first person they met when they started their undergrad degree at um, UCL. So we were a, a tight group of friends before we were co-founders. And it just, like I said, we, we had you know, a bigger group of friends with similar aspirations in life, but in the end they were interested in other things. They weren't interested necessarily in software development or, or helping people build software. They were interested in in music, in health tech, in data science, all that type of jazz. And um, I suppose that my, my piece of advice on the topic would be don't don't wait until you have a, a co-founder to start doing the thing, you know, like make progress. Because if if it looks like a sort of if it looks inevitable that you're going to make it happen, people will join. And that applies to fundraising as well, right? If you get started, you will make progress. You will clarify what you need in a co-founder in terms of complementary skills, what they can help you with, who you like to work with. You are more likely to get them to join if there's something that's um, sort of materialized a little and so on and so on. So I, I wouldn't personally... I wouldn't like to start a business by myself and I'm so glad I'm, I'm not alone, but some people do it and some people are great at it. I mean, uh, I think if I'm not mistaken, Alex Chesterman, who, who ran a big business called Zoopla and founded a new one called Kazoo in the UK, he's, he's been doing it solo for a while and he's an absolute beast. Um, it works generally wouldn't advise <laughs> yeah that's actually great because there are like great stories from both ends as you, as you were just giving yeah. examples like solo founding and co-founding and the points that you mentioned in terms of like sometimes when you're in the trench and like you're absolutely you like sometimes you feel completely beat but then like since you have really close co-founders with you and really just close people with you that gives you like the extra drive of doing it so you could definitely see there's benefits on on both ends but then like from your personal experience like i'm we're really glad i guess to hear from 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 that uh experience that you know having this motivation being uplifted by having different co-founders that's also good one of the other um point that you actually mentioned that was quite great was that um each member i guess from your co-founding crew is that they have like different backgrounds and different skills and different you know tools that they're able to cover more than just one aspect so imagine if you have four people with the exact same skill set and the exact same tools and you end up being like, I guess, co-founder with that, that slightly looks different, right? Just because what's going to happen if it's something that one of the members cannot cover, you know? So the composition is probably something that, you know, was was really advantageous for you guys there. Yeah, I mean, you know, you said what's going to happen if there's a thing you can't cover. Well, at the beginning, you have no money. So you someone learns it and off you go. And that's how you build your skills. And if you, yeah. if, you if you're lucky enough that you can hire someone, you know, some professional to do it, then you, you hire someone to do it. But, you know, mostly it's a lot more fun when you've got co-founders as well. It's a lot, It you know, what we're doing now at, at Step Size and what we've done is, is the hardest thing I've ever had to do doing it alone is always going to be a lot tougher. I mean, obviously, you know, you, you sacrifice equity in the meantime, but that is not a thing that I ever think about. You know, we're, we're all equal partners and shareholders at, at step size with my co-founders and I wouldn't see it any other way. But, um, you know, it's, it's, it, it, is a, it is something that you have to think about. I, I, I guess we were lucky and it's a bit unusual for us in that it just kind of happened. We didn't have to look for co-founders. It was just that's how it was. Um, not everyone's in this situation. That's the thing. And obviously coming from a from a tech guy, like a software engineer, like we always look at numbers. We love talking about numbers. And there are resources out there if you're ever interested in terms of like the, I guess, the success rate of projects with co-founder versus mm -hmm. like non-co-founders. So that's definitely a topic for another day. But uh, if you're interested with the resource, go look it out there. But hey, we have a live example of people absolutely loving uh, co-founding a project. So that is already super great. And... Uh, one of the actual points that you've also brought up that uh, I personally find really interesting is the big old debate, the age old question of bootstrapping versus like raising money and having investors in there. So um, as, as you build projects and you become an entrepreneur, like this is something that you have to ask yourself the question no matter what. I feel like you cannot avoid this question at the end of the day. Um, just a quick recap on what's bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is basically just relying on your own funds and making sure that you have some savings to keep the project going alive. And then 
the opposite of that is when you do get to a point, I mean, it's not that you've ran out of funds already, but you do see that you can get help from having outside investors into the project. That's what we, we, we consider as like raising money and investing. So uh, going back to the age old question in terms of for anybody starting projects like that, what are the considerations they should have uh, between mm-hmm. bootstrapping and, you know, starting to get some funding with uh, outside funding for the project? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. So I would start with what kind of business are you building, right? Not, not every company is built to raise venture money, right? Um, some companies cannot get off the ground without venture money. I'll give you an example. If you want to build a new kind of rocket and send them to space, you better have some capital to start with. And if you have it, cool. If you don't, you, you're going to need to raise some cash. On the other hand, um, when you raise some cash, you also, uh, you know, you, you dilute your equity, you own less of the company. So that's why it's an important decision. Now, there are also companies that even if they wanted to, would not be able to raise venture money because um, you know, VCs invest in companies that have a very small chance of a very, very big outcome. That's how the the sort of maths behind their models work, if you will. So unless if you're building a business that's meant to be absolutely massive and grow very quickly, you probably can't, couldn't even raise VC money if even if you wanted to and, and rightfully so. And then on the other hand, there's also something else to consider is that not every business needs to be massive to be successful. You know, maybe you aspire to build a little thing that brings in a, f- a few grand a month and that's, you know, that's life, that's your passion, that's what you want to do. Like, don't let that whole, you know, sort of, I raised a ton of cash as a status symbol thing um, get you, right? You, it, it depends on what kind of business you want to build. So I, I'd start with that. Then I would add that um, similarly to attracting co-founders, the best thing you can do to attract investors is just get started. So at the beginning, if you can bootstrap, just make as much progress as you can. Not only will you get a better deal when they do decide to invest, but it's also kind of a necessary requirement to, to get investment. I, I feel, you know, if you... If you go to an investor and show that you've made massive progress bootstrapping, they're just much more likely to invest. It makes complete sense. You want you want to sort of you want them to feel like this thing is going to happen with or without them, right? Uh, and that's on you to 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 move things forward to get to that stage. So that's my quick summary for deciding whether or not you should raise cash, and then from whom you should wa- raise cash. You, you can't go for for VCs. If you don't have a company that's going to have a, a very, very big in, uh, outcome. And if you want to build a smaller business, which is totally fine, there are plenty of other options that I'm not a professional at. I mean, you could raise money from friends and family. You could do angel investors. You could get a loan from a bank. I don't know much about this. I know I know a lot more about raising VC money. But that'd be my initial advice, yeah. That's actually like super valuable at the end of the day, even just hearing from that because... A lot of people will have the I, the very fortunate path, I guess, if they never actually end up needing to raise any money. Some companies yeah. end up doing that. So that is also a very viable path. Another path is people can do that, but they also want other people to get involved to get, you know, a bigger exposure and like, you know, just having this rocket growth kind of thing. Some people would describe it like that. So everything that you've said is definitely super valuable uh, just so that, and, you know, a lot of people are in that position today. A lot of people are trying to ask those questions as well. And just having a confirmation to be like, this is a way of doing it is also, you know, completely fascinating. So maybe I can sort of give the example, use step size as an example for, um, you know, why you would want to raise VC money. Like if it's a strategic thing for you to grow very fast and capture a lot of customers to be able to deliver on your 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 vision for the company then maybe it's appropriate to raise vc money and and of course if you can have a massive outcome and for us the plan was always to build a product that allows us to build the data set we need to work towards this crazy long-term vision and so you need to get a lot of customers very quickly in order to get anywhere so that's why it was appropriate for StepSize to raise um, venture money from a strategic standpoint. And on top of that, if you think about the out- outcome, what would the world look like if effectively anyone were able to build software? That'd be such a great thing. Uh, I can imagine a massive market for this kind of stuff. Therefore, it's an appropriate investment for a VC. 
I, the the train of thought that he just like kind of drew there, like that that is so good. Uh, I, do, I the only way I can describe it is good because not everybody has the capability of actually drawing this path, and the reasoning, the explanation behind every step is so justifiable. So hey, even for me today, right now, just hearing this, I'm learning so much on that. Um, and just like in terms of just like objectively, like what do you usually prepare if ever you get the fortunate chance of having a meeting with either VCs or outside investors, I guess, what are the few key documents that you should be aware of, of your own project? So one thing that I guess you mentioned that one thing I should bring in is obviously the product itself, like either whether it be an MVP version of the product, are there any other similar, like, you know, must needs before uh, preparations before the actual meeting with somebody who's interested into your project? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I think there's there's an element of it depends here. And the first one is it depends which kinds of investors you're speaking to. Let's assume that you're talking to venture investors. Even then, they, you can typically put them in two buckets. You've got the momentum-based investors and the conviction-based investors. And I'll explain what they are. A, a momentum investor is one that might look at your numbers and your growth curve and say, I'm in. This looks like a good business. A conviction-based investor is one that's going to listen to your, your long-term vision and your plan to get there and might be more comfortable investing even if you don't have the you know hockey stick growth curve that a, um, a momentum-based investor might be looking for. So I would approach either conversation differently. And again, the, you, should, you, should approach, um, you should only approach investors that are likely to be invest, uh, interested in your business. So for us, for, for StepSize, it was mostly conviction-based investors. You know, I told you about the vision for the company. We're trying to build a new category. It takes a lot of time. I'm not going to be able to raise cash from someone who's looking for a um, you know, graph with a, a hockey stick on it. It just won't happen. So it'd be a waste of time to go there. And then I think you hit the nail on the head. The number one thing that you can bring is like a product, something to play with. It doesn't matter if how early it is. It, it really doesn't. I remember when we interviewed with Techstars, um, you know, we showed them the product and then they asked us, oh, when did you release this? And we were like, uh, last night, at like midnight. <laughs> oh, okay. How many users do you have? Two, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that, that, that was it. So they they want to see what you're working on the and then you can go into a lot of detail you want to have some kind of a pitch deck although i would i would mention that it's not like you're going to stand up in front of a crowd and walk through slide by slide you want to have a conversation you want people to engage so the deck is mostly something in my opinion that's the way i, I run investment meetings it's something that you'll leave behind and maybe you'll hop through slide to slide to sort of illustrate a point that you're making in your conversation but if the investor is engaged you'll be talking right like like you and i are right now if you will um, but you do want to have a deck. There's plenty of great resources out there to help you build these decks. Depending on the stage you're at as well, you might want to have some kind of um, a growth model for your, your business. And that's not because investors want to see uh, an accurate projection uh, of, and, and sort of prediction of, of where you'll be in the future, but they'll want to see that you know how to reason about your company and which variables are involved in, uh, in, in, in how this business works and how you're going to get users and how you're going to make money. Um, that'll be a big part of the conversation as well. Uh, what else? We put together a one-page executive summary that would introduce the, the vision, the product, you know, existing investors, co-founders, that kind of stuff. It's a neat little way to introduce the company as well. And I think that that, that helped a lot. And then that was, um, I haven't seen too many people do this, but we also had a short document that talked about our, our competitive advantage, our moat, sort of how we win is how we called the document in the long run. Because, you know, you'll face this, this stupid question of, what if Google decides to do the same thing? And you need to have some way to explain why you're, you know, it's unlikely, but why you'll win um, regardless of that. And uh, we also had another little document that we called the road to Series A. That was when we were raising our, our seed round, so the next round of funding would be the Series A. That sort of explained the different milestones that we saw along the way. And, um, you know, mostly these things demonstrate that you know how to reason about your company, and then you, you, you get to that meeting and you have a conversation. Yeah, 
I mean, th- when you're saying like these are the stuff that you you are able to put out that because you've put the thought behind it that you've done obviously your own due diligence to actually produce these uh documents backing whatever your product is so um that is also also like really good advice just in general for if you want to get prepared and everything even for myself like learning a lot of these stuff that some of them i haven't heard before like it's super useful and um yeah just just want to po- put it from like a tech point of view is that like from somebody just working as a software engineer, which I do like most of the time, it's not these questions I don't ask myself that often. So that, that, there's one thing that's really interesting. Whenever I need a, a bit of a confidence boost before I, I went into like one of these investor meetings or whatever, as you meet some people who are a lot more qualified than you are. The thought that helped me a lot was to to realize that I am the number one step size expert in the world. No one except for my co-founders know the business like I do. Literally, right? Think about it the same way. You know, you are the only person who knows your project, your company, and these people are going to rely on you to explain what's up. <laughs> Funny enough, I've never seen it that way. But now that you put it that, it's so obvious what you're mentioning. It's like, you know, your you're like, you're routine to how you brush your teeth. Like, you know it from like the back of your hand, right? You know exactly how that works, every single function of it. And now that you kind of put the comparison that, that's what it is. You know exactly how your project works. You know how step size works. Like that is one of the definitely confidence boosters that you need going into all of this. So, yeah, and I'll tell you something else. It's fine to say I don't know. So if someone asks you a question, and you, know, you don't, you don't have to bullshit them. You can just say I don't know. I'll find out. I'll, I'll find out. What do you think? In fact, it'd be a bit of a red flag if you showed up with your early stage company or project and you said I've I've had it all figured out right? Like it, it does actually weirdly make people comfortable when you're, you're comfortable enough saying, I don't know, but here's how I find out. Here's my intuition about the problem. What do you think? Yeah, I, I definitely want to agree with that. Like saying, I don't know in my life is takes a very big part of my life. Actually, like I will agree with that, that <laughs> even just talking to other people. And when you do notice that other people do say it, um, it gives you that confidence that they're able to back up what they can't tackle right now. So I think like, right. it's just a concept that even as whether you're a software engineer or a co-founder or, you know, somebody just living life, like if you're able to have that attitude that you do know how to be resourceful, I think that trumps a lot of other qualities. Mm-hmm. So thank you for bringing up the, I don't know, because that's one of the motto I'll definitely <laughs> be hearing a lot more, uh, in my life. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's good. One thing I want to go back to, uh, actually not go back to, is Techstars. You you mentioned that because that obviously helped you um, really kind of like grow into this step size project even more. Um, so when did that come in into the life cycle of step size? So how old was step size when that came in, and how much did it influence slash pivot the whole project from that point? Yeah. So. I'll go back to the timeline again. We're living on top of the Chinese restaurant, working on our first idea for this this product that would help us build the data set we need. We get a few users and we're, I think it's like sort of February 2016, we start applying to um, things like Y Combinator and Techstars and Seedcamp. And, you know, we got we got interviews with some of them, we got rejected by most of them, and then Techstars came in. And we went through the process, um, Ryan Kuda, the managing director for, for this uh, program that we ended up joining is still, like he's a board observer to this day and still helps us with, with step size, right? That's how much of an influence it's had on the company. But either way, we, um, we go through the interview stages, we go to London, we get accepted, we join the program in the summer of 2016. And I think that one of the first things that we did when we joined the program is throw away the product that we'd been accepted with and build another one. And I think we might have done that again in the middle of the three month uh, program because the way, yeah, yeah, the way, the way it's structured is you get three months. Month one is when you meet, it's a mentorship driven program. So on the first two weeks you meet sort of 50 to 80 badasses who are going to end up, you know, you'll select sort of three to six of them to become your mentors for the program and maybe beyond. And then you, you hear their advice, your, your, your head's all over the place. You don't know what to do, but then month two is all about execution. You need to grow whatever numbers that, that matter to you and they help you with that. And then the last month is about if you're ready 
preparing for demo day and to raise a round of funding. So they sort of package you neatly to go raise a round of funding. And I mean, we learned so much in this thing, so, so much. I can't even begin to summarize it. It was, um, yeah, a life-changing thing. We, we, the business changed in absolutely every way during the program. Uh, the best part is when you literally mentioned after after joining the program, like scrap the first idea, like just jumped into a completely different yeah. one. That is, um, I mean, obviously, like you don't want to be doing that, but then like when it does happen, and you kind of realize that it's for the better, it's for the good, it's for the the bigger uh, vision of the whole project. Like those pivots, I guess, make sense, and it just you know keeps on getting the project going. But uh, we could definitely talk about the current focus, like the focus of Step Size today, actually. We mentioned already that it tackles tech debt, which uh, for, I guess, from a non-techies perspective, might always mean something. So one thing that we could, um, I guess, give a broad definition is what exactly is tech debt? And um, yeah, you would definitely be able to describe that a lot better than I can. So I'll tell you all about it. So. Technical debt is a term that people use to refer, and I'll go with a general definition, to any code in your code base that you've decided as a liability. And whether it's a liability because it's hard to work with or because it's causing bugs or because it's causing errors and outages, it's a liability. It's technical debt. People love to debate about different kinds of technical debt, but that's that's what I work with. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> Just because I do know... If you tell me that you're working on a project that doesn't have technical depth, I'll be very skeptical 90% of the time or even 95% of the time. Um, one thing I do want to mention, actually, if we're still talking about the definition of technical depth, um, when you're saying liability, we are talking kind of like a time span kind of thing, right? Are we saying that like some of them are currently very, very dangerous as tech depth, but it's also possible to have tech depth that just keeps on growing and it's like it will have an impact, but not immediately? Yeah, yeah. So maybe I'll... I'll um sort of backtrack a little bit and talk about the analogy for technical debt. It was coined, the term technical debt was coined by a guy called Ward Cunningham, if I'm not mistaken. And the analogy he's working with is um, seeing it as financial debt. You know, when you take out a loan, there's interest that you have to pay over time, you end up paying back the principal, and off you go. If you don't manage that financial debt carefully, you end up you know, in all sorts of trouble, homeless, you can't pay your bills, you're, you're, you're stuck, right? And the same goes with software. The second that you ship a line of code, you've got to maintain it. If you don't maintain it, it decays, it causes problems. I mean, think about the last time you tried to spin up one of your two-year-old uh, side projects and every dependency was broken and you couldn't even get the thing running, right? Like that happens. So another way in which I like to think about technical debt is as entropy in your code base right, is you're shipping things, your colleagues are shipping things, every technology that you're using is changing, your uh, understanding of the problem that you were solving evolves over time and the solution you coded up is no longer appropriate and that causes all kinds of problems and they manifest in different ways. So like you said, Perry, it could be time lost, you know, like engineering hours or it could be really, really, really bad stuff. I mean, I just saw a headline the other day. I didn't dive into it, but um, like so one of the latest Boeing planes that ended up crashing a couple times because a few lines of code uh, were messed up in some way. They didn't explain how, but you know, that like software can be life critical, if you will. So not every technical debt is equal. Sometimes it doesn't cause many problems. It might later. Sometimes it can be catastrophic. And that what this is one of the things that makes it complicated to handle is not only do you need, you know, as a commercial software engineer, not only do you need to keep up the pace and ship features week over week, you also need to maintain the code for the features that you shipped. And that calls upon the same resources and you've got some decisions to make about how you allocate your time to make sure your software doesn't end up keeling over. Yeah. And when you're saying that, like, I think the, the common goal that every people working in tech or even just working in, in any code base is that we do agree that we want to minimize tech debt as much as possible. The goal is that we have zero, which is, I think, impossible to have zero tech debt at the end of the day, but as close to zero as possible of this you know, liability that we're talking about. So there's some nuance to, to this thing. Um, so I agree, technical debt is inevitable. I wrote 
a few blog posts on the topic if you want to check them out on uh, blog.stepsize.com. But um, when you think about fixing technical debt, you don't need to boil, boil the ocean. You don't need to fix all of it. There may be a part of your code base that's absolutely, absolutely terrible to work with. You know, like no engineer wants to touch it. But you know what? It's not really causing any bugs. It's not causing any errors. And we don't have any features on the roadmap coming up that will have us touching this code. So it's okay to leave it alone for now. Instead, you focus on the debt that's causing problems that's in the way of some of your features you want to ship or some key strategic initiative for the company. So yeah, in a perfect world, if you could have zero tech debt, that's the goal. Realistically, it can't be done. So you're going to have to make choices. Yeah. And actually, uh, I'm glad you brought that up. To follow up on that, how does one, I guess, identify tech debt? As in, you know, when when you take a loan on a car, you kind of have like debt, right? You kind of, you know, you keep an eye on it and you have like the portals do it. But tech debt, obviously, it's slightly different. It's a little bit more superficial. It's a little bit more conceptual. So how does one go about uh, identifying tech debt? Yeah, it's so elusive, actually. That's that's one of the things that uh, makes it so hard to deal with. So there are a few ways to do it. And I'll talk about... Um, different methods that imply different setups and different tooling, right? So number one, your engineers who spend all of their time in the code base will be able to tell you where the technical debt is, even if they can't really quantify it or put a neat little you know, border around it, they'll be able to point to some part of the system and say, you know what, the authentication system is fucked and we need to do something about it. So number one way to identify it, speak to your software developers and write it down. Number two, there are a lot of code quality tools that will tell you about one aspect of technical debt, code quality. Run something like Code Climate on your code base and it'll score your functions from A to F depending on how indented and complex they are, etc., etc. That's one way to find code that could do with a refactoring. Now, what's a lot tougher is, um, you know, Technical debt isn't localized to a function. Usually a piece of tech debt will span multiple parts of your code base. That's where things get a little complicated and why we built the the product that we have at StepSize. Um, The way we do it is by allowing engineers to report technical debt directly from their workflow and organizing it in the different domains in their code base. So say this is the this debt is located in the authentication system that we mentioned earlier. Uh, I reported it from the editor, so I know exactly what code relates to it. I just wasted five engineering hours uh, debugging this thing, and here's the bug to go with it. So that's how they quantify the issue. And at the end of your, you know, after you've done it, done that a little bit with step size or sort of focused on one of your projects, you'll be able to tell this is the debt that we have in this part of the code. This is how much is costing the company. These are the features that are blocked because of it, etc., etc., etc. So these are just a few ways. I bet there are more. There are tools like Sonicube out there that sort of specialize in the code quality aspect of it as well. And there are um, other tools. Um, oh damn, I forgot the name. I'll bring it up later again. But they look essentially at data from uh, activity in Git to tell you that this code over there has been touched by many, many people and changes a lot, which is um, predictive of the fact that it might, there might be bugs. It's likely there'll be bugs over there in the future. That's kind of the landscape for identifying technical debt. Yeah. And (laughs) I'm going to say that the more you mention these uh, ways of spotting a different uh, tech debt, like I keep on getting flashbacks and like horrible memories (laughs) of like all the (laughs) events that they do show up. uh, And I guess my day to day, (laughs) experience but yeah those are super relatable for anybody working currently as a tech i guess uh, as a and software engineer we do have these moments when your number one priority talk to the software engineers because uh, a lot of them have seen it and the annoying part for them is not always being able to talk to them right away even though they know it's a tech debt like sometimes they're just worked up in a different i guess timeline or different project that doesn't allow them to do that so that is definitely a really good source of how you would identify a lot of these tech debt and uh, some of these tools that you mentioned, uh, they're actually really useful just because like when we're talking about whether it's code coverage, test coverage, or even just being able to spot like uh, how, how many people have touched this, like those are definitely super influential in terms of it, is it, are we going to, into the right direction of minimizing the tech depth at the end of the day? Um, one of the really cool thing is you've already mentioned like one of the metrics, which is basically uh, how many people have touched this piece of code. Like 
those are really valuable for people to know. And I'm guessing step, step size does a lot of that. When we talk about data, those are aggressive words, but that's basically what it means that it gives you an indication of like a metric indication of how that kind of landscape works. Um, yeah. So like in terms of like other examples of metrics, like I've, I'm fascinated by this. I'm, I'm a big numbers guy. I just love numbers. I've never been a math guy. Like I'm not great at math or all <laughs> that, but if we're talking about numbers, that's something I could go on for days. Um, if we were talking about in terms of like how many people have touched a piece of code, I guess that's one way of looking at, you know, potentially of tech depth. Do you have any other examples similar to that? Or do you even have a name specifically for that metric that we just described? Yeah, so what, what we were talking about here was um, what we call ownership, the uh, ownership score for a given, say, function or file in your code base. And Microsoft has done some great research on the topic. You know, I mentioned that um, some, you know, depending on your ownership score, it might be predictive of the fact that this function might uh, cause bugs in the future, for example. I'll tell you how to break it down. Uh, so if you think about ownership as this um, spectrum that starts at, only one person has ever worked on this function right here. Well, we call that absolute ownership and it's got pros and cons. You know, pros, you know exactly who to speak to when there's a problem with the code or when you need to do something with it. Con, the bus factor sucks. If this person leaves the company, no one else will know what to do with this code. So you typically don't wanna be in that situation. And then, you know, on the other end of that spectrum, you've got, um, you know, the situation where every engineer in the company touches this code all the time. I like think about, I don't know, your, your data models that just go completely nuts because everyone keeps adding to them or, or modifying them and it just ends up growing all, all, all kinds of crufts and, and hair and, and it gets completely horrible. That's what ends up happening with um, this uh, other end of the, the ownership scale. So you don't typically want to be there either. You want to be somewhere in the middle where you can think of, you know, if you point to any any functional file in your code base, we'll stay at that level. Can you tell which engineering team is responsible for that code? If you can, you're in this zone in the middle that we call collaborative, collaborative ownership. And it's the best of both worlds. You know, you, you have a team and people who own this code, you know who to speak to and who needs to fix it when it breaks. At the same time, teams evolve and it's fine if people leave or come and go there'll be this sort of tribal knowledge um, that you need to be able to maintain this code properly. And also um, you, you end up, the code ends up um, growing less hairs, if that makes sense, when uh, ownership is a bit more defined like that. And ownership is just one of many. You can sort of think of um, the intersection of these metrics that you compute from Git, like ownership, and a couple others, like say, you can look at Git data to see how much, how, how coupled two different files are. And the way you do that is by, um, you look at patterns in Git commits, which files always get committed to together. Okay, they're highly coupled. And you know that again might signal good or bad things. It might be fine for something to, to be coupled. It might be totally not fine for, for things to be coupled. And you wanna cross-reference these um, Git metrics with your code quality metrics. And these are the classic, you know, sort of cyclomatic complexity and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, your function's too long, your function's too indented. And if you can find, say, the parts of your code base that have terrible ownership scores that are highly coupled and on top of that poor code quality, you should probably go speak to the engineers about what the underlying root cause of that debt is. And that's when you'll enter the realm of, that's actually our, our most recent product focuses on, on this a lot, is collecting the qualitative data that sits in the heads of the engineers. Because like I said, these metrics will be good at pointing to you know, a part of your code that's bad, but it won't be able to draw this neat little border around the actual piece of debt that you should be fixing, you know? And that you will get by um, sort of extracting all that information that sits in your engineer's heads and organizing it in a sensible way in a tool like StepSize. Because the problem with technical debt is that it's not just a technical problem, right? It's kind of counterintuitive. If you speak to people who maintain open source projects, they will not have the same issues as people who work on commercial projects when it comes to technical debt. And the reason is simple. People who work on commercial projects typically have a lot of pressure 
um, you know, rightfully so, to ship features so that we can sell the product. And that means that if you speak to a, a product manager, they'll have a decision to make between allocating engineering resources to ship this new feature that everyone can look at, touch, feel, taste, whatever, and that appears on the product and, and clearly looks like progress and helps you close a deal versus allocating the same engineering resources to dealing with this underlying piece of tech debt that we spoke to. And the only way they can make this decision between shipping that feature or maintaining that code is if you've been like just as diligent about tracking your debt, measuring how much of an issue it is and making the business case for addressing it as you have been for making the bit, uh, sorry, as you have been serious about making the business case for shipping that feature. That was a very long sentence, but essentially to summarize, the real problem is you need to decide whether you're going to ship a new feature or maintain part of the code. And up until today, pre-step size, you didn't really have the tools to make that decision. So you ended up over-indexing on shipping features and your code base would go terrible and you'd do a big giant rewrite in five years. It's like a rite of passage for companies. Yeah, definitely. It, it's super relatable. I, I'll throw this a million times because... Um... So a lot of my background when working, I've worked in different startups and this story that you're talking about of decision between do we ship it now and kind of regret it later and like having this, I guess, refactor somewhere down the line. Like it's a very common story for these like, you know, earlier companies that are pushing out features because, you know, they, they have to, 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 you know, get the attraction and get all that. And then that's kind of like the, the investment, one of the investment that is, I guess, not in the financial aspect, but the investment is that, look, we're going to have tech debt. We're going to have to repay it. We're going to have to do it. But then when you're seeing that there are solutions out there like step size that comes in and be like, look, you could have, you know, the, the best of both worlds. You could you could be able to keep on shipping these and then having another like more conscious way of tackling the step and having a better way of dealing with it when you actually have to when it fully like blows up in your face like that is available over there. So but I want to highlight something that you said that's really important is that technical debt isn't necessarily a bad thing. You can use it for extra leverage just like you would uh, when you borrow money, right? Like your pre-product market fit, you don't know what's going to stick with your customers. You're probably going to end up throwing away 90% of the code. It's fine to be highly leveraged. Take on that debt so long as it's prudent and deliberate. What you don't want to end up in is be completely reckless, take on technical debt, unconsciously like you don't even know that you're taking it on because this thing will come to bite you but if you're prudent and deliberate about it depending on the company stage that you're at fine take it on do your thing that's not a problem that's actually great because uh right when you said when the tech that lives in somebody's head like i could definitely experience that like i've done many moments where like if i pick anybody for my team for example like and I ask them like where's the tech up in this? They'll they'll give it to you in a flash of a second. They'll know exactly where it is. But in terms of like actually having that fully written down somewhere, that's gonna be a different conversation, you know? So Yeah, and, and the thing that's really like just to add to the complexity, right, is that your engineers know, but making the decision about how you allocate your engineering resources and how you make a, a progress as a business is 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 a decision that involves more people, including non technical people. So not only do you need to know what's up with the debt, you need to be able to explain it in terms that non-technical people understand. And that's where the challenges come from. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. Um, one thing that's actually pretty cool is that as you uh, grow the project, the step size project, and then as there's more features coming out, you kind of want to have like a purpose of putting a feature out and you kind of have to want to have the, the um, I guess, the research behind it in terms of why are we doing this feature to begin with? Um, what I, what is the approach of you deciding what comes out next with step size? Obviously, I think one of the things that you mentioned is that you talk to a lot of users slash engineers slash non-technical people about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So look, I think uh, maybe over the last six months alone, I've spoken to about 200 software engineers who typically work in teams, right? Because the, the bigger your team, the bigger your... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And and it's been like five years. There's There's been a lot of conversations like this. And typically, they're people who work in um, in teams on, on fairly larger projects, because, you know, the bigger your team, the bigger your code base, the more technical debt is an issue, and therefore you should do something about it. So you have more of a need for what we're doing. But the way we decide what to ship next is typically driven by these conversations. And 
the reason I speak to so many software engineers is because when you start working with step size, you're not just buying a SaaS product, you're buying a process that sort of slots into the way you do agile software development. And we've, you know, I haven't invented anything. I've just taken the best from um, what I learned from speaking to these software engineering teams. And so the way we think about features in our product um, often map to the way we think about the ideal process for managing tech debt. So I'll give you a quick example. The way people deal with small, medium, or large pieces of debt is not the same. I'll define these quickly. A small piece of debt is a thing that you can just fix right then and there. Like you're an engineer you're in the code, you apply the, the Boy Scout rule, leave the camp better than you found it. You see a function that's a bit complex, you refactor it, off you go. You don't have to speak to anyone, you just do it. Then the medium uh, piece of debt is well, something a bit larger that uh, can be done within a sprint, you know, fits within a week or two of work, but should go through the same sprint planning process as other features because it's a, it's a sensible chunk of work. Um, for that one, you can't just fix it then and there. You need to speak to maybe your team lead, maybe the PMs, and they decide to put it in the sprint and off we go. And then you've got the larger pieces of debt and that's anything that's not fixable in a sprint. And typically you've got say a staff engineer that's gonna put together a proposal for these technical projects like let's upgrade to this new version of Ruby because here's the business case. And that goes all the way to company leadership, you know, CTOs, product leaders, uh, even CEOs who'll get involved at this level because it's a much bigger job. And then you end up putting this on your roadmap and you deal with it. So when we think about features that we ship at step size, we sort of, you know, imagine this in a, in a little matrix, uh, small, medium, large, which type of debt does it help with? Where do we have gaps in our product that means it's difficult for our users to deal with either of these types of debt? Uh, which companies in our pipeline need what? What kind of deals do we want to close? Okay, therefore, let's prioritize these features, if you will. And there's a whole, you know, I haven't told you about the, the design process that goes with this, but at a high level, that's, that's how we make the decision. Yeah, I think it's already super useful that the breakdown of looking at it from a small, medium and large, some people can't even make the difference between those. So I'm mm -hmm. glad you even brought up that that's one way of categorizing each one of them. And obviously, you've done loads of research into defining how these are helpful and how you're able to, you know, chip at it. You don't have to resolve the whole no. issue in a single go, right? You could always chip at it and then that will be beneficial in the in the long run. Sorry, no matter what. Exactly. Um, exactly. One thing I do want to point out there, actually, I just want to ask that. Does tech debt only come from software engineers? <laughs> Not that I'm offended by Ooh. any of this. This is more just a general concept in terms of, you know, um, are they the only contributor to tech debt? That's a great question. Um, yeah, short answer, I'd, I'd say no. And I just want to dive into something I mentioned earlier, just uh, clear the air a little. Even the best software engineers in the world, the perfect software engineer that doesn't exist will end up with some technical debt. And I'll tell you why. The software that you build is based on your understanding of the problem you're trying to solve. It sounds obvious, but it's worth noting. What ends up happening is as you build stuff and you get to know your users, your customers, your understanding of that problem will evolve, but your code will not, right? And so right there, you've got some technical debt. You're, you're going to have to do something about it, right? So tech debt doesn't just happen because of incompetence. It does sometimes, you know, some engineers um, do introduce technical debt because they're not good enough. But even if they were perfect, there would still be technical debt, right? Now, the reason I said it's not just the engineer's fault that there's technical debt is because you remember how I said that... Um, in open source projects, they often don't have the same issues with technical debt, and that's because engineers get to decide what they're going to work on. It's driven by the community, and there are no commercial pressures to ship a feature over maintaining this thing that you know is going to cause a lot of problems if you don't deal with it, right? And that's not the case in commercial organizations. So if you end up at a company where leadership does not understand technical debt, I think they have a great part in uh, you know whether or not technical debt accumulates and becomes a problem at the company and we can dive into that but no it's not just it's not just engineering's fault is because you know we work at teams as as teams uh, technical non-technical a whole company 
and the whole company needs to be aligned in the right way to make sure that it doesn't become a massive issue. Yeah, I'd absolutely love to echo off of that just because when we implement features, sometimes if it's a smaller feature, you'll obviously just be touching like maybe one or a few couple lines of code within a function, which is just a smaller feature. But then a lot of times if it's something that is much bigger, which involves like a bigger architecture change to the actual system that you're building on, then that will involve more than just, you know, engineers at the end, you'll have to see if it works with all the different products that you offer at a, at a company, which is why I guess like the kind of distinction I was putting that, yeah, it's really easy to tie tech debt directly to a software engineer, but a lot of that is very tied also to which level of changes you're making to, you know, the actual code that you're writing at the end of the day. So, um, yeah, that's a, that's a great point for me just clarifying my head. Because obviously, like, I, this is stuff that I have to live with day to day. Yeah. And it's, it's, um, it's funny because, you know, it's very easy to blame engineers for technical debt. So on the one hand, you've got that that sucks for you if you're a software engineer in a company that doesn't deal with tech debt property. But also, you deal with the consequences of the tech debt. You have to debug. You have to deal with the errors. You are the only person who's going to be able to fix it as well when you actually decide to fix it. But the reason it gets out of hand in the first place isn't just your fault. One thing I will say, though, right, is that it is, like, I, I don't want to sort of clear the slate and 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 um for engineers to feel like they don't have a responsibility here right the the business still relies on you to say there's debt and we need to do something about it right you can't just absolve yourself of any responsibility you've got a you have a part to play in this but yeah it's definitely not just the engineer's fault <laughs> yeah for sure like it's good that we just clear it out and like at the end of the day we're all trying to strive for a better goal at the end which is obviously reducing the yeah. tech debt it's going to make the engineer's life easier if they're able to work on a piece of code that doesn't make them cringe every time they touch it. So I feel like we're all on the same team and we're just trying to, you know, win a win at this uh, this game at the end. Yeah, I'd go even further as well than just saying we're trying to reduce the debt. We're trying to build a product that people use for and, you know, get value out of, right? And, and take that to just one piece of the equation that people tend to forget about. Yeah, one piece that is very important at the end of the day. I'll say that a million times and I'm pretty sure you could agree on that. Um, and just as a tiny little side note, like you did mention the word evolution. I have to agree that it, like from what I've seen is sometimes you would be the person writing a piece of code and then you'll revisit it a couple of months down the line and you'll be like, I definitely wrote that and there's definitely something wrong or a lot of wrong stuff with it. So that's kind of when you're looking back at like maybe it's some tech depth that you yourself wrote you know, a while back that you weren't able to spot. And then this evolution of you just becoming better at the end over time, that's something that you'll be able to recognize. So that's just another point that I do uh, experience. The the other thing as well is that, that it might not have been tech debt at the time, right? Like you, I don't know, I'm, I'm going to try to pick a stupid example. You build software that um, enterprises in the UK end up using and you have no need to like deal with international currencies, and then your business goes parabolic, things are great, you've got customers all over the world, and all of a sudden, these people want to deal with every currency out there, and you have to deal with foreign exchange rates and all that kind of shit. Well, the code that you wrote before is not appropriate for that. You didn't, you know, you rightfully didn't future-proof it because that would have been counterproductive. You, you solved the problem that you were solving at the time. You didn't solve every future problem that could come up. I, that is a amazing point, uh, just because the problems are, I guess, obviously within the time frame of what that year. It, some of the problems that you do encounter is that like they're nice to have problems, as in, <laughs> and you'll get to that point. You're in a better spot, and you're getting these problems because you're in that better spot. So uh, I'm I'm glad it's actually put in uh, put in that context uh, when we think about it. Um, but yeah, like we've discussed a bunch, so much stuff already. To wrap up, to wrap up a couple of things, like. You know, what, what kind of advice do you have for people going into the path that you've gone so far? Just because it's so fascinating, mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of people would actually, you know, have to think about it. So any general advice for people thinking about that? Yeah, and so I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to give, um, give interesting pieces of advice for, for both, you know, the, the take that angle and the maybe I'm, I'm going to start a company angle. Um, you know, for the, the company thing and, and taking the deep dive, um, I suppose... What's the worst that can happen? You know, I mean, not everyone is is in as fortunate a position I was in when um, I decided to start Step Size. But really, what what's the worst that can happen? You you fail, and and then you you've learned 
so much in trying to make it work that you're now eminently employable by other people who are building companies just like the one that um, you were trying to build. So what's the worst that can happen? <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Absolutely love that. And then uh, for technical debt, you know, just just be deliberate about it. It doesn't matter which... Um, I suppose it does. There are right and wrong ways to do it, but be deliberate about it. You know, if you if you need a hand, I'm always open to um, having a chat with this stuff. But think about the your your goals as a company as a team, and think about how the different pieces of tech debt will get in the way of these goals. And one easy way to do that is pick up your product roadmap and look at the features on there. Think about the bits of the code base that you would have to touch if you were to ship these features, and that will be the debt that you should prioritize. If you leave with anything, you know, any piece of advice about how to deal with technical debt is that. Pick up your roadmap, clear the debt that's in the way of that roadmap, and then you'll be doing much better than uh, a lot of the teams that I speak to. (laughs) That's amazing. That's definitely going straight onto my to-do list. Um, Yeah, where, where can people find you? Where can people follow you and StepSize? So you can go to stepsize.com if you're interested in checking out the product, sign up, we'll have a chat and I'll tell you all about this and I'll give you a hand and we'll get you on the product. You can also find me at on, on Twitter at Alex Omeyer. So A-L-E-X, you knew that. Omeyer is O-M-E-Y-E-R. And Stepsize is Stepsize HQ on Twitter. So check it out there. And yeah, drop us a line on Twitter. Send us your best technical debt memes. That's the thing we're doing at the moment. There are some good ones and uh, we'll have a laugh. Amazing. There we go. Well, hey, Alex, just want to say thank you so much again for being on the show. Thank you, Perry. It was great. It was a great chat. I really enjoyed it. Time just flew by. Yeah, I was going to say, as if people don't enjoy being on it. I'm just kidding. But hey, uh, that's going to be a wrap for this episode and I'll catch you guys on the next one.